Hey everyone, Dr. David Clark. Today I'm going to be explaining how wheat and gluten can cause the autoimmune condition type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune form of diabetes. I'll, I'll talk about the difference between type 1 and type 2 in just a minute. So let me just kind of give you the, the lay of the land. In type 1 diabetes, the immune system is attacking and destroying uh, one or more of the following. Okay, The first thing it can attack and destroy are these things called beta cells inside the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas is made up of these things called islet cells. And the beta cells, which I'll show you in a little graphic here, uh, those are the ones that produce insulin. Okay, So that's the first thing that your immune system can be attacking in type 1 diabetes. Uh, the second thing is called glutamic acid decarboxylase 65 or GAD65. Now what that is, is that is what we call a, uh, a neuroendocrine enzyme. You find it in the central nervous system. Uh, it helps make the neurotransmitter GABA. Uh, but GAD65, this little enzyme, is also found in those pancreas islet cells. And a free, like how much GAD65 is floating around, it is kind of used as a measure of how much damage there is to these pancreas islet cells. And your immune system can make antibodies, right, can make antibodies to these uh, this GAD65 and destroy it. Um, ultimately, what happens, whether we're talking about beta islet cells or GAD65 or, or even the other things that I'm not even going to talk about, like insulin and insulin receptors, uh, what happens is you end up not making enough insulin. Okay, So what, why would that matter? What does insulin even do? Well, insulin is what most people, if you think about it, have heard that insulin has a big deal to do with your uh, blood sugar and your glucose control, and it does. Essentially what happens is you know, your pancreas releases insulin, and insulin binds to these insulin receptors on cells, and it helps that cell bring in glucose. Now, it's, it's more complicated than that, but that's just a simple explanation for, for our purposes. So what happens when you don't have enough insulin is you start getting high blood sugar, otherwise known as hyperglycemia. And that leads to a lot of different complications. So let's just kind of focus on what are the symptoms of type 1 diabetes and low insulin. Well, if you look at the uh, research literature that's been done, the most common symptoms in both adults and children are excessive thirst, fatigue, frequent urination, and weight loss. Now, in adults, there's a couple symptoms that are a little more frequent. Adults are more likely to report blurred vision, uh, vaginal yeast infections, tingling in the hands and feet like neuropathy symptoms, and slow healing of sores. Now, those last two sound a lot like type 2 diabetic symptoms, uh, which we'll briefly talk about in just a second. Now, in children, the more common thing you see is they tend to have stomach pain, uh, nausea and vomiting, and flu-like symptoms. And in fact, uh, like a type 1 diabetic sort of uh, crisis, like the initial presentation of that, often gets misdiagnosed as flu or just some sort of gastrointestinal illness. <clears throat> now, again, in type 1, what's happening is uh, the immune system is going after the insulin-producing cells or this uh, enzyme that's inside the uh, pancreas. And <clears throat> in kids, when this happens, it's just called like juvenile diabetes or type 1 diabetes. But type 1 can occur in adults. The difference is type 1 is autoimmune, type 2 isn't. Now, there is another condition I'll mention briefly that's called latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult, or LATA. And it's basically just type 1 in an adult. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> it just means it's an autoimmune form of diabetes. Now, just to briefly, again, the contrast between type 1 and type 2 is type 2 is not autoimmune. Uh, type 2 is because uh, ultimately you become insulin resistant, uh, which means you're not responding to the signal of insulin, and that can lead to beta cell exhaustion, where ultimately you can't make insulin, which kind of looks like type 1, but it's two different mechanisms. Okay, so that's the lay of the land as far as what is type 1 diabetes, and now I'm going to explain how gluten and wheat can cause that. And to do that, we have to kind of define what gluten really is. So let me take you to a slide where I explain that. Right, so we have to answer the question, what is gluten? If I'm going to use that terminology, we've got to figure out what that is. So here we have good friend uh, wheat. We're going to call this whole wheat. Now, wheat can be kind of broken down into a couple different uh, components. The first thing we can look at are what we call the proteins in wheat. Uh, then we can also look at the non-gluten proteins. So I'll explain what gluten is in just a second. 
And then we can look at uh, the lectins. And if we just kind of look at lectins for a second, uh, the big lectin inside wheat is this stuff that's called wheat germ agglutinin. And you'll hear me, men you hear me mention this throughout a lot of my videos. But that's what that is. It's a lectin. And lectins are something that all plants have. Uh, I always explain to patients that it's kind of like this little soapy, sticky substance. Uh, and wheat germ agglutinin can be a problem. Uh, we're not going to talk about that in this video because that's not really the problem as it relates to type 1 diabetes. But it is part of wheat. So we've got the proteins, we've got the non-gluten proteins, and we've got the lectins. Now, as far as proteins go, the big kind of umbrella term is gluten, right? But gluten is made up of a couple different uh, components. We've got these things called exorphins, which, again, I'm not going to talk about in this video, uh, but it can be particularly relevant, especially uh, when we're talking about uh, gluten as it relates to autism spectrum disorders. The other part of gluten are these things called uh, glutenin. Now, in parentheses there, I've got a 21, and that is denoting, um, it's, we call it like an isomer, it's a fraction. So when glutenin is digested, it can become this stuff called glutenin 21 mer. Uh, that's kind of technical. I'm just putting that in there for people that might be interested. And then over here, uh, the other component of gluten is gliadin. Now, gliadin's a term uh, that I'll use a lot that you'll see in the literature, but you'll notice that it's not the only thing in wheat, right? We've got proteins, we've got non-gluten proteins, we have lectins, and then under the umbrella of gluten, we've got exorphins, glutenin, and then gliadin. Now, even under gliadin, we've got different sorts of little pieces of that. We have alpha, which can be turned into alpha-17, alpha-21, or alpha-33, uh, mer. So the, the, tech, the terminology would be alpha gliadin 17, alpha gliadin 21 mer, alpha gliadin 33 mer, and then there's also gamma gliadin and omega gliadin. Now, the story's not done because when we our digestive system processes uh, gliadin, we use an enzyme called transglutaminase 2. That's the one you find in the, the GI tract. Now, there's some other transglutaminases that can be very, very relevant uh, when we're talking about autoimmune conditions. There's transglutaminase 3, transglutaminase 6. But the point here is when these gliadins are digested via transglutaminase, like, you know, uh, when I say digested, I don't mean like dissolved. I mean they're broken down. Uh, they can become this stuff called deamidated gliadin, which uh, you can have a problem with. And there's even these things called gliadin toxic peptides, which I didn't put on here. But the point is, this is gluten, okay? So gluten's not, uh, you just got to know what we're talking about. So a lot of times I'll use sort of gliadin or gluten as sort of a catch-all term. But really, this is how complicated it is. So in type 1 diabetes, the problem is this, cross-reaction. Now, remember on that graph I just showed you, there's a stuff called alpha gliadin 33 that alpha gliadin 33 mer is a cross reactor or molecular mimic with GAD65 and those beta cells that produce insulin. So what is cross reaction? Again, let me pull you to the, uh, the animation here and I think I'll explain it pretty well for you. Okay, in cross reaction, here's the situation. We've got thing A, all right? So for our purposes today in type 1 diabetes, uh, thing A is going to be a food, and that thing A is alpha gliadin 33 mer, or just for practical purposes, wheat, gluten, that kind of general term. Now, we've also got thing B in cross reaction, and today's example, thing B, is the pancreas beta cells and that enzyme GAD65. So the problem in cross reaction is that we have antibodies for thing A, right? So we have antibodies uh, for gluten. And as you can see, that thing, uh, A, the antibody is going to stick to it because it kind of fits. But in cross-reaction, the antibodies for thing A can stick to thing B, even though thing B isn't the same thing as thing A, right? So in this example, thing A, which is wheat, antibodies for that can stick to pancreas beta cells and GAD65. And that can promote the immune system attacking the pancreas beta cells and the pancreas GAD65, ultimately leading to low insulin and the symptoms that we talked about. So that is the heart of cross-reaction, when the antibodies for one thing can stick to another thing. And why does that happen? Well, because as you can just kind of visually see here, thing B looks similar enough to thing A that those antibodies don't know the difference. And that is the basis of cross-reaction. There's kind of a, 
a shared homology, if you want to use a technical term, of these amino acid sequences. Uh, there's molecular mimicry. But that is the danger with cross-reaction. And that, really, simply put, that's how eating gluten can cause and trigger type 1 diabetes. So let me review that again. In cross-reaction, the antibodies for one thing attaches to the second thing and can promote the immune system attacking both things. Okay? And in this type 1 diabetes example, we know that alpha-gliadin 33 mer, which is a piece of wheat, looks very similar to GAD65 and looks very similar to the beta cells that are producing insulin. Ultimately, what can happen is by eating wheat and having a problem with wheat, you can promote destruction of GAD65 and beta cells, which leads to low insulin and leads to those symptoms that we were talking about. Now, the kind of, there's kind of two scenarios here. If you have kind of brewing type 1 diabetes, this kind of cross-reaction thing can push you over the edge where you have like overt type 1 diabetes and low insulin, okay? If you already have overt type 1 diabetes, cross-reaction can make it worse, okay? So the takeaways from this video today are the following. <clears throat> Number one. If you have a family history of type 1 diabetes uh, and you're eating wheat, I would get tested to see if you've got some of these antibodies. Now, this is, this is not really a video about testing for type 1 diabetes. I've got some other videos on that. But you need to get correctly tested uh, based on your age and some other factors and find out, wow, do I already have these antibodies? Why is that important? Because some of these antibodies can uh, be detectable for several years before you get ultimately diagnosed with, oh yeah, you can't make insulin, and so now we have to give it to you. And in that time, there's things you can do. Number one, you can stop eating wheat, <laughs> right? Uh, there's things you can do to modulate the immune system to try to correct it and regulate it. Uh, so I would strongly advise, you know, just in general, getting tested, uh, and you know, probably also stop eating wheat, barley, and rye. Now, the second takeaway is, if you already know you have type 1 diabetes, and you've watched this video, I really hope you strongly consider stopping doing that because of the real, real potential that it's doing you harm. And do you need to have like a gluten sensitivity test? I wouldn't even waste time on that. I mean, uh, the odds are very good that you're going to have uh, antibodies to one or more pieces of wheat. And so I just wouldn't be eating it. That's kind of my general uh, recommendation. Now, to be fair, though, there's a lot more to this problem that I'm talking. I mean, I'm kind of simplifying it, making it sound like it's just two or three issues, but it's a lot more complicated. For example, we talked about cross-reaction, right? Well, there are some foods that cross-react with gluten. So to make it really complicated, you could be eating something, even though that you're gluten-free, that your immune system thinks is gluten, that also cross-reacts with the pancreas beta cells uh, and, <clears throat> and the GAD65. There are foods that cross-react with things I didn't really even talk about today, but that are still relevant, like insulin receptors, zinc transporters, uh, there's more foods that react with those uh, islet beta cells. So please don't DIY this. This is way too complicated and way too serious to be trying to like, you know, Google it on your own. And that's why I made this video is to try to give you, you know, some knowledge to understand what's happening. But ultimately, you got to be working with someone uh, that understands all of this and understands not just how to diagnose type 1 diabetes, but what do you do about it? Not just do you give it insulin, not do you give insulin, but what are things you can do uh, to the immune system because it's way more complicated. So I know it can be difficult to find someone who knows all that stuff, but don't give up. Uh, find someone who, who is educated and who is up to date and work with them very closely on this.